One complete wing of the American invasion forces received air medals for their magnificent work on the Normandy landings. Seldom have so many deserved so much. These 2,600 medals were struck to commemorate their supreme and matchless feat of arms. Major General Paul Williams, commander of the United States Troop Carrier Forces, made the presentations personally. Officers on the same operation received distinguished flying crosses at the hands of General Brereton, commander of the 1st Allied Airborne Army. This sergeant saved the lives of an entire plane crew. Buckingham Palace also was the scene of recent British investitures. This driver virtually saved a town when his munition train caught fire. An Australian brigadier and a United States captain drew the DSO and DFC. Three VCs went to an Anseo leader, an African veteran, and a D-Day hero. Underground pictures have caught the desperate German flight from Antwerp. The Belgians tore down road signs and made every effort to impede and confuse the Nazi exodus. Mysterious defects appeared in Nazi transport, further slowing the enemy retreat. There was hardly time to unfurl the flags before British and Canadian tanks streaked in on the heels of the Germans. Belgians took their first joy ride in three years. The Nazis were not even given time for their usual work of demolition. Their eyes were on the false security of the threatened secret line. Belgian resentment was exercised bitterly against collaborators. Their homes were stripped and furniture demolished. The Belgian Marquis thwarted the flight of many of the Germans and paraded their cats back to the Allied prisoner cages. The port of Antwerp was left almost intact and may soon become another of great Allied supply funnel. At the moment, the Nazis are fighting bitterly on its water approaches, attempting to keep the port immobilized. But time and the tide of allied military power are engaged in bringing this resistance to an end. The first United States Air Transport Command plane flew from New York to Paris in just 19 hours. It brought General Marshall, commander of the United States Army, for consultation with Supreme Commander Eisenhower. Also aboard was Associate Justice James Burns. Generals Bradley and Smith were on hand to meet their distinguished superior officer. This meeting comes as the Allied armies are preparing to cataract en masse across the German nation. American air forces have literally drenched the beleaguered German city of Aachen. Aachen became the first German town of any size to find itself completely cut off from the Wehrmacht. Artillery joined the attack, while American ground forces east of the city completed its encirclement. Powerful armored divisions made slow but resolute progress in the forests surrounding Aachen. They pushed their way through and smashed every counterattack the Germans managed to launch. The first 13 days of battle here produced 9,000 German prisoners. It's now merely a question of time whether the entire German garrison must surrender or face annihilation. Hundreds of German civilians had taken refuge in the nearby woods to await the American forces. Growing numbers of Germans are finally having a taste of that war they unleashed on so many others. The enemy population has moved to special camps behind the Allied lines. 
Many of these Germans profess relief that the Gestapo and their own army have been driven out, but all will receive realistic treatment as actually or potentially dangerous to the Allies. British soldiers have returned to Greece, and historic Athens, capital of ancient freedom, eagerly awaits liberation. The immortal isles of Greece are being restored. Once they were blemished by Circe's swine, and more lately by the Hitler breed. But now, as elsewhere, the Nazi curse is being lifted. The Aegean landings were virtually unopposed. Units of the Royal Navy soon made friends with the ill-fed peasants. Already 30,000 tons of wheat have reached the country from North America. Everything possible is being done to dispel the Nazi-induced famine. The faces of the Greek peasants and the handwriting on the wall bear the same message. Greek partisans have fought in heroic battle, matching the valor of their Northern European compatriots. They fight with German arms, captured in hand-to-hand -hand forays with the enemy. The modern Greek is no less valiant than his ancient prototype. For the first time since this war began, the British and Greek flags are unfurled side by side. Patras was the first large city to be freed. Native and liberating troops marched together in close and friendly comradeship. The populace of Patras demonstrated its emotions with religious fervor. Among the banners wave palm branches reserved for those who bring the fullness of peace. This devotional procession is usually seen only on the occasion of church festivals. Leaders of the many Greek resistance movements shared honors with the liberators. The town's mayor rode in from his mountain headquarters where he'd been directing the local guerrilla campaign. This birthplace of freedom has reclaimed its birthright. British paratroopers were first to land, but they were soon followed by a full RAF regiment. The latter were given every help possible as they prepared their first landing strip near the Greek mainland. The flag was hoisted within a few hours and the first Dakotas came in with supplies. Supplies also came by sea as Greek troops cheered the barges ashore. The officer in charge decoyed the Greek children, giving his men a chance to go about their duties. But there was no escape. Tradition had its hour. The liberation of Greece is well underway. Freedom is returning to its ancient and classic home. <laughs>